God's word this morning. You know, last week we finished our study on prayer. And, uh, and I hope that your prayer life has improved because of that study series. Today, we begin our study of the book of Acts. The title of today's lesson, To the Ends of the Earth. Come on, bro. You know, we just began First Principles with the Men, and I know that was an incredible midweek. I got a glowing report. Uh, for those of you who know, I was up with my father up in Seattle, and uh, it was great being up there with my dad in Seattle. He had surgery. He had a, he had a couple of discs removed, and his, his spine fused and all of that, and uh, uh, it was a great time being with him. Uh, Dylan and I went up together, uh, and yet the, the, it, it, my dad's an incredible man. He had two discs removed on Thursday, and... Um, Wednesday at noon, he got out of the hospital, checked out. And he's got no legs, and he's 75 years old. He, you know, he's buzzing, ready to get out of the hospital. And, uh, and that provided a great opportunity. Joel and Courtney, who lead the church there, uh, came to visit him on Friday for three hours afterwards and really ministered to him. And he's agreed to go to church with them and to study to be restored to the Lord. So, amen. Amen. And, you know, we've had a lot going on in the church here. And uh, there's been a lot of transition. There's been people moving. There's been all kinds of things happening. And uh, today I just want to set a new tone for everybody. The transition is over. Amen? Amen. It's done. It's over. Everybody's moved. And it's time to get this engine going. You know what I'm saying? Now, there will be more transition that comes. This is the kingdom of God. The wind blows wherever it pleases. So when the wind blows, there's more transition that happens. But for all intents and purposes, the recent events of transition are done. And we're going to crank this church. Amen? There's a word that's tossed around very freely that I'd like to talk about today. The word greatness. The word greatness. You know, in everyday conversation, we use this word all the time. We go, oh, that was a great restaurant that I went to. What a great movie. You know, that, that, guy, that guy's a great pitcher. That's a great quarterback there. And yet, uh, I got a great deal on a computer. It's usually a cell phone now. And, and yet, we use the word great to set something aside because it's hard to find and awesome. And as we study the book of Acts together here, uh, I, I take a chapter-by-chapter chapter approach. we got 13 lessons on the book of Acts that we're going to do here. I want you to see how great God's church is. I fear that many of you, when you hear the word church, think only within the scope of what's in these walls right here in this room right now. And yet I want to expand your view today. I want to inspire you and motivate you to understand what you have being a part of the kingdom of God. Amen? The kingdom of God is phenomenal. It's a treasure. It's something that the Bible says men are willing to sell everything they have for. Put away anything plans they have. Change all their dreams. And that means their schedules. Yeah. And go after the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen and yet as we go through this series, I would like for you to ask yourself but one question okay. as we go through these lessons. Oh, it's a motivational question. So take it that way. If everyone in the church were just like me, that's what you're asking yourself. Okay. What kind of church will this be? See, we should hit 10 like that because you're awesome. I got a great time with the Lord. I'm doing great. The kingdom is awesome. I have salvation. My sins are forgiven. That's where we all want to get to here today. Amen. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Until the day he was taken up into heaven, after giving instructions to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles he had chosen. Luke starts off this book saying in my former book, Theophilus. Well, Theophilus is not a real guy. Theophilus means friends of God. And prayerfully, that's what we all hear today, are friends of God. Amen? Amen. At least you're here because you want to be a friend of God. And yet... 
This is a personal letter. That means this letter that we're reading right here is a personal letter written to you as a friend of God. Amen? And, and yet, this is a continuation of the book of Luke. Scholars say that this book that we're about to study was written between 60 and 70 AD. And so, um, nowhere does it mention James being martyred in 62 AD. Uh, or the persecution under Nero in 64 AD, or the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So that, we think that, that puts it somewhere around 60 to 62 AD, where this was written. And I think it's important as we study this to understand that the work of Christ is both finished and yet still unfinished in many ways. Of course, the work of salvation and the forgiveness of sins for everyone is totally finished. That's really good news. Amen? Amen. And yet the work of proclaiming God and that good news was just beginning here and continues on generation after generation through the friends of God. And so as the book of Acts begins, there's an enormous transition that's happening. Up to this point, Jesus had been doing Primarily all the work of the teaching and the preaching and training all the disciples. And so the burden of proclaiming repentance and God's news was about to just come and sit squarely right on the shoulders of all those who were following him because he was about to be taken up into heaven. And so the apostles who were the disciples being trained were about to become the trainers for the rest of the world. Is that not awesome? And so, from a human standpoint, the apostles, they were in no way ready for this. They had just proven that because when Jesus was crucified, they just scattered everywhere. And most of them went back to their old lifestyle to a degree. Even going back to, I'm going to go back and go fishing again. And so, they had not handled themselves well in the midst of Jesus' arrest, arrest and crucifixion. And so... They felt incredible failure. And they needed inspiration and motivation during this time. They failed not only in public, in front of everyone, but they failed in their own personal relationship with God to believe all that Jesus told them was going to happen. And so, we move on here in verse 2. Our first point today is that we all get a great preparation. A great preparation. Acts chapter 1 and in verse 3. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Isn't it amazing that he had to prove to them many, many times that he was alive? Yeah. We have to have people prove to us that the Bible is alive and actually works. Isn't it amazing how much we're shown just like Jesus showed himself? And yet we still do it our own way. Yeah. Today I want to encourage you to just know the Bible through Jesus is alive. It works if you really just obey it. Amen? He proved to them that he was alive. It says he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave this, this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. A great preparation. No successful team wins a championship without great preparation. Jesus certainly understood this. Now, we understand that Jesus had a singular focus the last 40 days he was here. For 40 days, he taught about the kingdom of God, the very treasure that we are to lay our lives down for. And yet it takes great preparation. You know, we've been going through a project that we call Prepared for Service. And, you know, during this project, we've done many events that... I want to make sure you understand are not singular events that we just do and wait for another event to come up. These are all things 
geared toward building patterns in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. The first thing we did is we had a night of atonement. Amen? Yeah. You guys remember that? Was that not phenomenal? Yeah. To see person after person get up and confess all their sins to everyone in the church. Yeah. Wow. Now some of you who are visiting you might be like, what in the world? <laughs> we actually do that. Yeah. We actually get real and honest about the bad stuff in our lives. Yeah. We all actually know the worst about each other and we actually still like each other. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I challenge you to find another place on this planet where that can happen. Where you really do know the worst. And you go, wow, that was bad. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, amen. You got Jesus. I got Jesus. We're going to get there together. Amen. amen. And yet, I hope that you haven't waited for another night of atonement to confess your sin. I hope you took that understanding that this is a building a life pattern. Yeah. I hope you've taken that as a daily life pattern. That you have a daily time of atonement. Confessing your sins to your brothers and sisters. So that you can have real fellowship with each other. Amen. Well then we went through life talks. And you know we all would love to think that we're all just strong all the time. Yeah. And yet we're not. Yeah. And you know I've been here. I've been back in LA for just over a year. And I think I've had a few life talks since I've been here. <laughs> And I was supposed to be the leader, you know? So, there you go. Uh, and yet we have life talks. Why? Because those who are beginning to get weak are pray for Satan. And so we get together to save them, to strengthen them, so Satan does not take them out. Yeah. And yet, you know, you don't have to wait on an official life talk. You can just see your friend hurting. And you can grab your Bible and you can strengthen them with the Word of God. You can actually just say, here, I have a gift for you. It's called faith. It's this scripture, and it works if you obey it. And you've given the gift of faith to your brother or sister to strengthen them. Then we went through a review of the discipling tree. And for those of you who are visiting, we, we base our church is uh, teaching one another on Matthew 28, 20. It says, teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded. Yeah. And so we actually in the church engage in teaching one another how to be obedient to God's word. We all have areas that it's hard to be obedient for us. Yeah. And so we focus on those areas and we help one another be obedient. And so we went through a review of who's helping who. Uh, we actually figure out who's helping who to make sure everyone's needs are met. Yeah. And so we went through a review of the discipling tree. Now, everybody has a discipler. Everybody should have some D times going on every single week here. And if you're not, I'm going to put it out there for all of you like, like Tim does. If you're not having a discipling time, if, you're, if you have a discipler and they're missing your discipling times, you come see me and we'll come fix on. that. Okay, we're, we're not having that where we have members who aren't taken care of. Yeah. This is the family of God. It's a sanctuary away from the world, and we're going to keep it that way. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And then we did our Bible Talk Expo. And that was a phenomenal time where each Bible Talk got up. And, uh, you know, some people were like, I'm not even sure what Bible Talk I'm in in the middle of this transition. All this is going on. And so we, we organized the Bible Talks and each Bible Talk got up. And when you got up here, you guessed, you knew which Bible Talk you're a part of. Oh. And your Bible Talk leader told you what geographic area you're focusing on, uh, where you're getting people, and where you're bringing them out to. And you guys got to take a picture together. And you go, there's nobody going, you know, I don't know what Bible Talk I'm a part of. I don't feel family. Everybody's a part of a family. Every family has a great charge. And now we're ready to take the city. Amen? <laughs> then we did a song devotional. And, uh, you know, I, I, I saw when I got there's lots of new Christians that don't know the songs. And the songs are going, you're going. <sighs> and so we practiced our songs. And I, I don't know about what you thought today, Tim. The singing was incredible today. And you guys sound phenomenal. And so... You know, we chose some eight, eight core songs that we're going to do so that we can do them well. Because guess what? When we go to heaven, guess what we're going to do before the Lord? We're going to sing. And there's not going to be anybody mouthing words. It's, it's, nobody's going to, anybody that's going to mouth words isn't going to be up there singing. They're going to be pouring their soul out to God. So that's why we're doing the same eight songs over and over and over. So we know them well and can sing them with all of our heart. Praising God just like we're in heaven. Amen. Now all of that preparation.
nation has been gearing up for a, an event coming up. You should know which event that is. It's the Bring Your Neighbor Day next week. Amen. And so next week, after all that preparation, that's geared so that we get out into the city in these geographic areas of our Bible talk and we convince all of them to come to this geographic area right here in this room for our Bring Your Neighbor Day next week. Amen. So, so here's the deal. You're looking around the room. Okay, we're trying to bring at least 329 people, right? Okay, you go, well, I don't know if they're going to fit. So this is what we're going to be doing next week. This podium is going to move back, right? This projector is going to go over there somewhere so it's out of the way. We're going to put a couple more rows of chairs here. We're going to put a couple more there. We're going to put the sound booth more toward the back. And we're going to be able to fit 350 people in this room right here so that we can blow this thing out. I mean, you just got to think about it. If you're God sitting up there and you go, okay, the Southland region has like 10 million people to evangelize in this little, in this one area of our region. So they're going to bring 350 people, like drop in a bucket. Let's get this room filled next week. You have your sins forgiven. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You've been prepared. You've been trained. It's all square right on your shoulders. No pressure or anything like that. But, but this is just like what we're reading here in the book of Acts. It was the disciples' time then. It's our time this week. Let's blow it out next Sunday. We've appointed our web deacons, our shepherds, and all, the, all of the roles. And yet we still have more roles to fill. And yet we've been thoroughly prepared. See, Jesus was preparing them in their spiritual boot camp for three years for the coming of his kingdom. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you think about those three years, turning water into wine, feeding thousands of people with a fish. I mean, it was crazy. Like yesterday, we fed 110 guys. And we had, like, tables of food for 110 guys. Can you imagine one fish just into tables of fish and it probably tasted like chicken for those who didn't like fish because that's just how God rolls you know and yet no matter how much Jesus does for us we always seem to need one more miracle we just always seem to need one more and we can see a week full of miracles and you just go I just need one more I'm just not there yet and that's why God gives us things like Gary getting baptized yesterday. proud of Gary you know he's been studying the Bible and you know in, in the middle of the week he's like yeah yeah you know I'll get baptized at the right time right time yeah really that was like when I'm ready and we go you know most of us go well yeah when you're ready well you know he finally realized something if I get hit by a bus today this is what he said yesterday if I get hit by a bus I want to make it so when's when's my time well it's, you can, your time to be ready, you can choose is now, today, or you can choose eh, maybe some other time. And that might be God's time today for you. And, and I appreciate it because we talked yesterday and he was like, dude, you get me in that water today. They're like, are you ready? Yes. Are you going to? Yes. <laughs> Just, yeah. Why? Because he understood he's seen the kingdom now. He needed to be a part of it. We can't lose sight of what we have being a part of God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. You know, with that, on the back of the bulletin here, you've got our 2016 GLC. Yes. This is a time where we see physically the representation of the kingdom of God worldwide. You don't see that every week here. Now, if you look around the room, you see there's all kinds of different races in this room. Amen. There's black, there's white, there's Hispanic, there's all kinds of stuff. And, and yet, we still don't get it until everybody pulls together. And what you got to understand what's happening here in the book of Acts right here is that they were getting ready to all pull together for the day of Pentecost. And so, they were taking time off of work. They were putting away their money. They were getting their sacrifices ready. They were prepping their kids. They were packing their stuff. And they are on their way to Jerusalem. And, and so that time of year for us 
is the end of this month at the GLC. Can you imagine the day of Pentecost came and they weren't there? Can you imagine, like, we're going to read Peter's sermon next week as we study Acts chapter 2. Can you imagine walking in, oh, what's going on? Oh, Peter already preached. You're late. Do you miss, do you miss the coming of God's kingdom that Jesus spoke about for the last 40 days? Like, wow. Like, we just don't get it. We stroll all in with our coffee. I mean, I, I mean, I come in with my nose. I'm here, but you missed it. Because you couldn't get up to see the kingdom of God. Because you forgot what you have. You know, Jesus came to the disciples uh, many times to convince them that he was alive, the Bible says. First, he appeared to the mirror bearers. Uh, then, he, uh, in, then he came to the empty tomb. Then he came on the road of Emmaus. He resurrected to the, he, the resurrected Jesus appeared to all the apostles. He appeared to them at the Great Commission. And he appeared to them with doubting Thomas. He appeared to them right before he ascended to heaven. The miraculous catch of fish. We forget that when Peter was reinstated, that Jesus was appearing to him because he had already died. And yet, I think the one of greatest importance to us is the Nole Mi Tangere. And Jesus appeared to them, and he gave them that phrase. Nole Mi Tangere. Which means, stop clinging to me. Yes. You know, we do all these events, these prepared for service events, and we do our men's days, and we treat them as one-time events. And then we wait for the next one. Like we're watching a movie. And yet, Jesus had to tell his 12, stop clinging to, to me, my physical body. They were waiting for Jesus physically to be there to lead them for everything they were doing. And it was time for them to grow up spiritually. It was time for them to really believe in the Trinity. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And he's saying, stop clinging to physical me and start having faith in listening to the Holy Spirit me because I put it inside of you. See, Jesus isn't going to physically come down here and do anything for you. Physical Jesus is not here to lead you. Instead of being here in person, he did something better. I don't want you looking outside of you for what to do. I'm living inside of you. So you already know what to do. As a disciple of Jesus today, you need to cling to the spirit of Jesus that's living in you that gets fanned up and welled in the flame by reading your Bible, by having a great time with God in the morning. You, like the church in the first century, have received a phenomenal preparation. There's been bulletins and articles and crown of thorns and men's days and prepared for service projects and everything under heaven to prepare us. And now is your time. You are prepared. God is in you. You are saved. And the rest of this world is waiting for you. Our church has gone through a great preparation. So we move on in verse 5. Our second point, the Great Commission. Verse 5. Do not leave Jerusalem, uh, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not time for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority. See, you don't know what's going to happen in the kingdom and when. And it's God's authority that moves everything. It says, but you will receive what? Power. If the Holy Spirit's in you, you've actually already received this power. 
you already have it living inside of you to say no to sin, to perform miracles by helping people know the truth and watch them respond to it. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth, he says. Wow. After this, after this, after he said this, he was taken up. Can you imagine that? Jesus is right there, right before your very eyes. He's taken up before their very eyes. Wow. So it says here, after this, he was, take, he was taken up before his very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? So we know what they were doing. They're like, whoa, wow. This same Jesus, who's been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the very same way you have seen him go into heaven. Wow. You can't make a movie that good. Don't, you don't, you see, you can save that money from the movie ticket and put it right there to GLC, and you got your movie right there. It's pretty awesome. This is the Great Commission, according to Luke. And yet, he was telling them that you're going to receive power. Like at that point, they don't even know what you know right now with the Holy Spirit in you. And amazingly, you know, these, these guys, like Jesus has been walking with these guys for three years, right? Does all these miracles, all this destruction. So for 40 days, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God. I think some of us might have been like, can you change the topic, please? You're not feeding me very well. Like, because that's how we get, you know? And, and this is how much they got it. They're like, Whoa, okay, Jesus calls them up to the mountain. They're up there. Okay, what are we going to do, Jesus? Are you going to restore? Like, are you like David? Are we going to go kill everybody now? So that's what they meant to these guys. They're, restoring a kingdom meant you kill all the enemies. So they're like, all right, we're ready. Like, these dudes were ready for battle. He's like, no, I'm leaving. What? <laughs> Can you imagine, like, it was, must have been just total dead silence, like, is he going to appear again? I don't know. Like, whoa, okay. And then, angels. And they're like, dudes, what are you doing? I mean, why are you looking? He's gone. He's gone. It's you. You're him now. Woo! <laughs> Goosebumps. It's you. It's you. Pull out your uh, handout out of the bulletin. I made a nice handy handout for you here. If you, uh, there's two sides to it. If you pull the one with the little globe on it out first. This is called the Great Commission. Great Commission. This is called the Crown of Thorns Project. It is based on the Great Commission. Amen. On this account of the Great Commission. So, as you can see, oh, yes. the plan for world evangelism for the sold out discipling movement. Isn't that interesting? It's the same scripture we just read. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you, who's you? Raise your hand if it's you. <laughs> How about that? Don't be looking up for Jesus. It's you. You'll be my witnesses in, Jer Jer in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. So, our plan, like, first of all, where can you go? And you got some little short chubby dude up front going, okay, I, we have a plan. It's just, it's to, it's to evangelize yeah, everybody. Everybody, like literally. Like it seems so outlandish, you're like, what? What are you talking about? We're going to actually evangelize this world while you're alive. Where can you go when somebody actually has a plan to get the good news to everybody for real? And then beyond that, have the wisdom to fit it all on one page. Like, really? Like, that is actually wisdom from God. That you can organize the evangelization of the world on one page. 
So we're basing it off the same plan. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Los Angeles, like you're so fortunate to live in Los Angeles. Yeah. We're treating it like the modern day Jerusalem. Then you have Judea and Samaria, which is the United States and Canada. Why? Because those are the countries where Christianity is, where we're free to have Christianity still that actually have the most resources to really get the thing moving. Then you got Judea, our current churches, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Sacramento, you can read through them all there. Then you got Samaria, all the other churches, and now to the ends of the earth. So there were 12 tribes in Israel. That's why there were 12 apostles. That's why we have 12 crown of thorn cities. This is not a plan just for Los Angeles to fund everything and train everybody and do everything. These are like 12 more Los Angeleses that are going to send out from their locations, that are going to train people in their locations to evangelize their areas of the world. That breaks down again and again and again. And that takes us all the way down to our region, if you flip over. I've developed for us our own Crown of Thorns project for the Southland region. Amen? And so, our little Jerusalem is Bellflower. Then our Judea and Samaria are going to be our college campuses. Where we have the idealistic, fired up, zealous young people who are ready to really change this world. Not like our older married people aren't fired up or anything. Since the marrieds have been bringing and baptizing, the marriage and singles have been bringing and baptizing almost all the people. So right now they're the most fired up people in the church. No pressure campus. No pressure campus, but you guys should be blowing us out of the water, but we're waiting on you. We're just kind of keeping it moving along until you guys just really jump on it there, you know? Now, this is going to be the shocker to most of you because you didn't think throughout the middle of Compton and Watts and Lemur Park and Huntington Park, Huntington Park and all these places had real campuses. And yet, we have Antioch University. We have CSUDM. We have Cerritos College that we're taking back. Um, then we have Compton College. We have El Camino. Do we have El Camino here? I didn't really hear anybody. Oh, okay. All right. We actually have Los Angeles Southwest College. And we have West Los Angeles College. And then... You'll see the planting of the Bible talks. I got Inglewood and Southgate wrong. We have those. Those should be green right now. But, uh, but you see the cities that we're going to go for. So we've got 10 million people in this area. And we're going to have 12 house churches. Right now we have three. We're going to 12, guys. We're going to saturate this city with the word of God. Now, last week... Last week, I, I made a bulletin for us called Heroes in the Faith, right? This week, it's called Dynamic Disciples. And you get to see a picture of Jesus as a disciple. See, we, we forget he was a disciple of the Word of God. He said all the words, then he came as a physical man, disciple of those same words he spoke long ago. Then he lived it out in the same way we should be living it out. Then we get Jesus' teaching on discipleship. And you can read through some of his teachings on discipleship. Helping one another. There's a bunch of scriptures there. But then you get to see Jesus as a discipler. Like, whoa. Some of us are like, my discipler's not helping me. My discipler's... Blah, 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 blah. You, you know, Jesus was the perfect discipler. That gives you a picture of how to be a great discipler for somebody. But here's the funny thing. The guy's got attitudes with Jesus. He never made a mistake. So how much more with us? Yeah. Our disciples aren't perfect. Isn't it funny how we expect our disciples to be perfect? Yeah. Like, dude, you sinned? Why? What's wrong with you? Be an example for me. And yet today, it sits squarely on your shoulders to be example for a lost person. Because you're their discipler the moment you meet them. So I did that so that... If you're like me and you're terrible in your note-taking skills, yeah. you can at least take something home with you and have a great quiet time on the topics that we're talking about, which is being a great disciple today, man. Yeah. We'll be having those every week. In fact, one more thing. 
We'll be having these articles every week. I, I believe the people that come to visit deserve to have us put something in their hands that says, hey, here's what we're all about. Yeah. What we choose to write about says what we're about. Yeah. And on the back, it says what we're about as well. And the same Crown of Thorns project I just handed out is right there. It's been right there the last two weeks. Why do I put it there? So that you'll take this and use it in your quiet time. So that you'll take it and break it on out and you'll pray through that. Yeah. See, you'll, at the GLC, you're going to be sensitized. You're going to go, wow, you're from Santiago? He's going, see. See. Yeah. You're going to go. <laughs> you know, can't do nobody. Huh? <laughs> and somebody will go, what's your name? Go, oh, my name's Ron. Oh, Ronaldo. <laughs> and you're going to see disciples from other parts of the world. But then you know what? The ones that you connect with, you're automatically going to start praying for their part of the world. I'm giving you this now so you can pray for their part of the world before you meet them. So you can be sensitized on a worldwide level. You also get all the people who have been baptized. And when they got baptized... And what they're, and if they got a little nickname, I put their little nickname there, and you know that's pretty cool. Sometimes we go, "Who's that guy that got baptized again?" If you if you have this and you're praying for them, that Satan doesn't take out our young ones, then you'll know their name. You see everybody who, who's been restored. At the bottom, you're going to see something else here because we're talking about the Great Commission, right? What does it take to get to every part of the world? It takes people, and it takes money, and it doesn't just take people. It takes trained, prepared disciples of Jesus who are ready to take this world and money. And so you see right here the date of our service, what the attendance was. And then you see the contribution. We have right now, as of Gary's baptism, 131 disciples in our region. Amen? You're never going to hear me rounded up to like, okay, it's 130 or 135 because every number every, is a soul. And we pray through every soul. Yeah. And yet, we have 131 members. At our services, we have anywhere between 35 to 40 kids that come every week. So you can add that up. You got 40 kids, 130, it's 171. So if everybody's here, and all the kids come, and not a single visitor is here, our attendance is about 170. Look at that sheet. Yes, sir. What that says is there some people calling themselves disciples who are trained and prepped who don't come to service. And, ever, and then you can look at the contribution. And what we pledge, our pledges are just over $4,000 is what we're pledged in. We're just like any company in the sense we know what our income is. We can only spend as much as we have. So if you pledge to give and it doesn't come in, we make a budget based on what you pledge. Now we have to pull back. Now, the coolest thing is that we just moved to this place, right? We saved $2,000 a month just by moving here. That's awesome. Now, and God's provided like in a phenomenal way. And yet, what does it take for us as a church to run just this region? Well, I've got the P&L statements from the, from the accountants and everyone. And basically what it costs our region to run is $7,000 a week. That's what it costs after saving $2,000. Wow. So we give, we're, our pledges are $4,000. So, amen. When I got to D.C., the pledges were about $4,500. And when I left, when I, well, when I left it was $7,400 a week. We can do the same thing here. What it takes is understanding what you have in the kingdom. Yeah. And you being yeah. all in is what it takes. Yeah. That's all it takes. You give to the Lord your money. You give to the Lord your time. You give to the Lord your heart. Guess what he does? He gives back. He gives back more than you can ever imagine getting back. More than you can ever imagine. Now here's also how God works. He gives you a certain amount of money to live off of. Just call it 10 oranges, right? He says, I gave you 10 oranges to eat there. They're juicy, they're awesome, they're incredible oranges. I just want one back. That's it. 
make life worth it with what I gave you. you. You get nine, I get one. That's a pretty good deal. And yet, we take that one that's for the Lord, and we like carry it around with us so that we're tempted to eat it. We spend all the rest, and then we go, oh, there's only one left. Huh. And then we go, oh, you know what? I got cut it in half, Lord. And we walk around eating it. And then we go, and, and now we've stolen from the Lord. And then we go, like, if we give to him and he gives back, what if we steal from him? What does he do? He takes back more than we can ever imagine. Yeah. And it's a never-ending cycle that we don't get out of until we give to the Lord what's his. Now, let me just be very clear. I don't need your money. I don't need your money. I don't want your money. The world needs your money. Yeah. Yeah. The world needs your heart. It takes resources to build the kingdom, and the resources come from the kingdom. In, God takes one penny and multiplies it beyond what you could ever imagine he will multiply it into. We do have a great commission. I love that he was up on the mountain here with them. It was the one place that, you could, that they could go up to and they could see all of the places that they had gone in their ministry. Can you imagine being up there like, dude, that's where you walked on water. Like, Peter, dude, but you fell. <laughs> Dude, you remember that, remember that guy, Legion? Like, that's where, dude, I ain't going back there yet. They could see everything. He took them up to help them remember. Do you remember when you got baptized? Do you remember when you got reached out to? When you had prayed for somebody to come in your life? When you had cried yourself to sleep and somebody cared enough about you to put their money in and to spend their time and to bring you out? Now it's your time to be that for somebody else. You are the answer to somebody's prayer who's crying themselves to sleep every night. The church has been given a great commission and you have been given a great commission. Thirdly, a great calling. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Come on, God. Come on. Come on, bro. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Now, why did Peter do that? Because Jesus was gone. Somebody always steps in and fills the role. There's a group numbering about 120. And he said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke about long ago, through the mouth of David concerning Judas who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and he shared in this ministry. With the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. See, the Bible's rated R. <laughs> Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this. Like, wow, they were all talking about this thing. So they called that field, in their language, a keldama, that is the field of blood. For, Peter said, when it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us from the whole time the Lord went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. From one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Bersabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. How did they make their decisions? Then they prayed. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven disciples. Yeah. A great calling. See, these guys understood 
that Jesus, that God created leadership. And that you cannot go without leaders in necessary positions. The apostles represented, what, 12 tribes that would lead the rest of the world to Jesus. Now look at one of the, what were the qualifications of being one of these leaders. Hmm, it's pretty interesting. They just had to be there from the beginning. That's it. If they lasted Jesus' discipling and ministry, they were good. Like, wow. They had to make it through the spiritual boot camp. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. This will, be, this will be our last scripture today. 1 Peter chapter 2. Come on, Rod. Come on, bro. Man. Hey, campus guys, that's toward the end of the Bible. Oh, amen. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> 1 Peter 2 9. Let's make it sure you're awake. I want you to let this scripture speak directly to you today. If you are here today, it is not by man. It is not a mistake. It is by God that you are here today. It is by God that of all weeks, out of all cities in this world, out of all places, that God chose you to be here today. And this scripture, just like the book of Acts is written to you as a friend of Jesus, is written directly to you as well. Now I'm an older man. I'm 45 years old. About to be 46. Been around the kingdom 23 years. I've seen a lot of people come and a lot of people go. I've seen a lot of sin. I've seen a lot of miracles. A lot of miracles. I don't need one more. I've had plenty. Every one of them is, that's, it just builds on what I already have. And yet, we can never understand the depth of this passage enough. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A people belonging to God. Wow. It's got to have a moment of silence right there. So the old you is, that's like the one minute of silence for the old you that died right there. You're holy. You're royalty. You're separated from the rest of this world. Do not taste, do not touch, you know. It's what we do when we're separated. But you were called to this for a reason. It wasn't to squander yourself on sin. It wasn't to come in late every Sunday and miss the boat on all the things in the beginning. You notice we, st we switched it up on you? We put the lesson at the beginning now. Put the lesson at the beginning for a reason. It's to train you to stop coming for the lesson exactly. To participate in the communion. We're supposed to participate in the communion, the Bible says, as one man. As one body, one man, we ask God for forgiveness as we take the bread for our own sin. We forgive anyone and everyone who's ever sinned against us in any way so that we're clean. And we take that, we remember his broken body, that that's why he died. So I can be forgiven and everyone else can be forgiven by me. Amen. And as one man, we do that act together. Then as one man, we take that one orange and we give it back. Or we take two or three because we really believe in what we're doing. Amen. And we give back to God what is due Him so that the work of God can be carried out. And we also have a sermon by a sinful man who doesn't deserve to be up preaching. <laughs> At any man's best, he does not deserve to be up here. And yet, we try and pick which, which guy do I think deserves to be up there more? None of them. None of us. Does it really matter who gets up here and preaches if you have the type of relationship with God that we're talking about right here in the Scriptures? Does it really matter who's discipling you? Who's leading a Bible talk? Does it matter who goes or comes or stays? Uh-oh. 
The first century church understood that to be a disciple of Jesus was to be a believer who obeys God, who respects God, who reveres God, who honors whoever God puts in whatever position, knowing they're sinful, they're going to blow it, so i got to lift their arms up because they're going to blow it. Not tear them down and go, you're not worthy of being up here. Guess what? I'm not worthy of being up here, and you're not worthy of saying I shouldn't be up here. God decides who should be where. The calling in the first century church is the calling of the 21st century church. And you just got to ask yourself today, if everyone were just like me, what kind of church is this going to be? A great church goes through incredible preparation. They understand they have Jesus' dream through the Great Commission. A great church is full of great members, every one of them, who is always ready for the great calling to step up and fill every gap. I give us two weeks. We had 20 leadership slots. We have six more to be filled. Two weeks, I want them filled. It's your time to step up. It's your time to lead. It's your time to do your best, and you're not worthy to be up here, but neither, neither of any of the rest of us. It's just the heart to get up and do what you can for the Lord. Today, let's be ready to go anywhere. Let's be ready to give up anything. Let's be ready to do anything and take this gospel to the ends of the earth. I love you very much. Next week, Acts chapter 2.